Hello and welcome. This is Dr. Lewis with a very quick put together PowerPoint on systemic lupus erythematosus. This is done to replace the voice files that are currently posted on Blackboard. So let's get started. So lupus is considered an autoimmune disease, which means that the body develops an immunity to its own self. Uh, the etiology of lupus is unknown. Um, however, they have seen that some autoimmunity is related to genetics, um, environmental or hormonal factors. Uh, you may have a genetic predisposition towards the development of lupus, and they've found that women with, with lupus seem to have decreased levels of some active androgens or hormones, which can inhibit antibody responses. So they're, they're trying to figure out why the body turns on itself, but they don't know yet. So, I, you know, I work better with a picture, and the pathophysiology to this picture is on the following page. What lupus is, is an autoimmune response to cellular components. So, as I'm circling the mouse here, you'll see this big glob of stuff. In lupus, you develop autoantibodies to cellular components. It could be DNA, it could be proteins in a cell structure, but it's different cellular components. And what happens is you have the antigen, so this is whatever the cell is, and an antibody attaches to it, and then another antibody attaches to it, and then another antibody, and then you have an antigen over here, and you end up with what they call an antigen-antibody complex. So if you can look at this vessel, you can see that these cells are very small, your red cells, your lymphocyte, okay? Then you've got this big glob of an immune component. So think about what's going to happen when you get into the capillaries and microcirculation. Right? If you said it's going to get stuck there, you are correct. And part of the pathophysiology of lupus is that these antigen antibody complexes become lodged in the vessel walls, oftentimes in the circulation, and cause a localized inflammation. So it's a systemic disease that causes localized areas of inflammation, just to kind of clarify that, because it can cause inflammation in a variety of places in the body. So the patho, much like I said, production of a large variety of autoantibodies, hyperreactivity of B cells, secondary to disorder T cells. So both of your lymphocytes are just not working well. Your autoantibodies, which are commonly produced in response to nucleic acids, DNA, ribonucleoproteins, and other proteins, react with antigen to form immune complexes which go into the circulation and are then deposited in connective tissue and blood and lymphatic vessels and other tissues. So I like to call lupus a disorder of the itises because it triggers an inflammatory response and causes local damage and inflammation to organs. The kidneys are the number one concern for patients with lupus because if you think of the kidneys and you think of the glomerulus, that's a very fine network of capillaries that if you start developing inflammation in those areas, you're going to end up with problems with renal insufficiency, nephritis, musculoskeletal system is a common place for occurrence, um, the brain, the heart, uh, so pericarditis, uh, lungs like pleuritis, okay, the spleen, so there's a lot of different areas. Some drugs like procanamide, hydralazine, and INH can cause a drug-induced lupus-like syndrome, but this will go away when the drug is discontinued. So, oftentimes lupus and rheumatoid arthritis get presented side by side because the symptoms are going to mimic R RA initially. And once it's the body basically having an immune response, so you get a fever, a low-grade fever usually, anorexia, you're tired, you lose weight, you have achy joints, everything kind of hurts, your muscles hurt. Generally, you're going to write that off as you're coming down with something. You feel kind of fluey. However, there are some classic manifestations. One of them is the red butterfly rash, which is also called the Malar rash, M-A-L-A-R. And this is across the bridge of the nose. Photosensitivity. So patients with lupus are going to be very sensitive to the sun, and they need to be careful not to get too much sun exposure. Discoid lesions, which are basically disc-shaped red raised lesions on the skin. Okay, they may develop hives. Erythematous fingertip lesions, meaning they have red lesions in the fingertips. Splinter hemorrhages are linear, um, linear red lines that 
come on the um, fingernails, which often are significant for microemboli. Okay, you may have painless ulcerations in the mouth, and you may have alopecia. So those of you that are more visual, like myself, it, it's easier to see that this is an example of the discoid lesions. It almost looks like a psoriasis. Okay, the malar rash, which is that butterfly-shaped rash across the bridge of the nose and the cheeks. Okay, another example of a discoid lesion. And this is a picture of Raynaud's, Raynaud's phenomenon. And actually, I think it's Raynaud's syndrome. So patients with autoimmune disorders can, are much more likely to develop Raynaud's. And uh, Raynaud's is that vasospasm that occurs in people who are exposed to cold weather. And so they develop problems with hypoxia to their fingers. So, so as far as the systemic manifestations of lupus, basically if you put itis after anything, and you could have it with lupus, uh, because there are a variety of symptoms and a lot of it depends on where the immune complexes are deposited in the body. So you may have pleural effusions. Remember, fluid accumulation and vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, are part of your inflammatory process. So you have pleuritis, you have inf inflammation of the pleura, developing pleural effusions. You may develop pericarditis, lupus nephritis, okay, arthritis, Moving on, renal impact. Um, I can't say this enough. The renal impact is huge. Uh, lupus, while not being number one or number two reason why people are on dialysis for chronic renal insufficiency or chronic renal disease, it's a high level because patients with lupus have a high risk of developing nephrotic syndrome and problems within the nephron. Um, it says 10% develop renal failure, but at least 50% of lupus patients are going to have some sort of renal impact. And so you have to watch for proteinuria. That's kind of your first thing. You start spilling protein, then you know that there's something going on. Hematologically, you can have a decrease in all three of your blood cells. Okay, as you can see, there's a lot of itises here. Uh, so I'm not going to read them, but you can have a lot of itises. Respiratory-wise, you have pleur pleurisy or pleuritis, pleural effusions. And then you can also have some transient neurologic changes. For example, OBS is organic brain syndrome. Memory loss, you can have disorientation, decreased intellect, or it can be as bad as seizures and psychosis or stroke. But wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> as you can see, conjunctivitis, problems with blindness liver enlargement and spleen enlargement because the spleen is an organ, it's an um, immune, you know, an organ associated with immun immunity. Women who are of childbearing age who become pregnant may actually have problems with carrying a fetus to term. So let's talk about diagnostics. And diagnostics for lupus, uh, I hope that you get a chance to look at the little video that says I Medical School. Uh, and it goes into a lot of detail, and it's more detailed than you need, but it's, they do a great job of explaining signs and symptoms and manifestations and diagnostic tests. So you're going to look at the anti things like anti-DNA antibody. And basically, a lot of the tests are looking for those autoantibodies. Anti-DNA antibody is one of them. It's not the only antibody test that they do. And ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. All this is going to tell you is that you have inflammation somewhere in your body, but it is going to be elevated. Serum complement levels. Complement are substances associated with inflammation, and they're going to be elevated. Your CBC is going to show a possible decrease in all three of your blood cells, while you need to watch your BUN and creatinine for any signs that you have an alteration in kidney function. And you would want to follow your the um, UA to make sure that the patient doesn't develop proteinuria. Okay, medications. So generally they're going to start, it's an inflammatory condition that has autoimmune problems. So you attack it from two different things. You're going to attack the inflammation with, you guessed it, anti-inflammatories, and you're going to attack the autoimmunity with immunosuppression. So as far as 
medications, they may start with NSAIDs and including aspirin. Aspirin is considered an NSAID because it is an anti-inflammatory drug that's not a corticosteroid. So by definition, it is that. Okay. Hydroxychloroquine, also known as Plaquenil, is an anti-malarial agent. So this is another one of those off-label uses that they've found to be very effective for the management of lupus. So a lot of patients with both RA and lupus end up being placed on hydroxychloroquine. I will caution you that there is a risk of retinitis with hydroxychloroquine therapy and patients on Plaquenil need to have a dilated retinal exam every six months. For systemic or topical inflammatory manifestations, you can use steroid therapy. However, remember, steroid therapy has a lot of different side effects. We're going to talk about a lot of them when we get to Cushing's because it's the same side effects, but you always want to tread carefully with corticosteroids. You can suppress the immune system, and these medications here are medications that are generic immunosuppressants. So azathioprine, cyclosporin, and cyclophosphamide are all immunosuppressants that can be used. Okay. You may also see what are called DMARs, or disease-modifying drugs. So things like Humira or Enbrel, and I'll talk a little bit more about them with RA, are medications that you could see for lupus, but you're more likely to see it with RA. As far as non-pharmacologic treatment, you tell the patient to avoid smoking. At minimum, they've got enough going on but you want to try and minimize any of the side effects. Let the patient know they have increased risk of effect infection because their white cell count may be decreased. If they're on corticosteroid therapy, then you're talking about an extra problem with increased risk for infection. The client needs to be taught to watch sun exposure and to have a high SPF rating of sunscreen. Um, healthy diet, the avoidance of birth control pills, I can't remember why this is, and I'm not too worried about knowing it, but it is important to teach patients the, the side effects of medications. So in other words, if they're on a corticosteroid, uh, sometimes patients don't understand why their blood sugar goes up. Um, if they're on a long-term steroid, they need to know that they're gonna have weight gain, that they may have changes in fat distribution, things like that. So that it concludes the PowerPoint on lupus. Thank you for paying attention and I will see you in class.